Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Reimagined on Think Tech Hawaii. We're living in a world of uncertainty and facing massive disruptions to our labor markets due to automation and now COVID. In Hawaii Reimagined, I will be featuring innovators and entrepreneurs, both locally and globally, who are creating innovative solutions to make a positive impact in our communities. And we'll be learning what these innovators are doing so we can have inspired conversations about what Hawaii's economy and the future of work might look like as we emerge from the effects of these disruptions. I'm Ruby Menon, your host. And as we're trying to navigate our way in the world of work, I help people navigate their career transitions in my Career Get It Done Mastermind community. And you can learn more at brainsmartdesign.com. So I'm super excited to introduce my guest today, who is Alec Wagner. He's a director of the Purple Prize that started in 2016. And the Purple Prize is an innovative competition that brings together people across sectors to build technology solutions that create value for land and people. And to date, they've worked with over 40 teams and have awarded those with the highest potential to create real impact in Hawaii. So we're going to be talking about their unique approach of integrating technology with Hawaiian values and cultural practices and what interesting projects they're doing with workforce innovation and also any COVID Pitch, uh, pivots that they may have had to make. Uh, and just as an aside, I had the incredible blessing of being able to participate in the Purple Prize with a social enterprise inmate art project that I was working on in 2019. And I can only tell you that it was a game changer for me. I learned so much, not only about business, but of uh, Hawaiian practices and cultural values. And so uh, I'm just so excited to have uh, Alec be here on this program. And welcome, Alec. Uh, I'm just thrilled that you're here and to tell us. And I so want, I want to hear so much more about some of the cool things that you've been doing in the Purple Prize. I uh, want to find out more about you and your story and the story of uh, Purple Maya as well. So let's dive right in. Um, can you start by telling us a little bit about yourself and how you even got to the Purple Prize? Uh, well, thanks so much for having me, Ruby. And, um, you know, I, uh, you talking about the CARE Project uh, and your participation in the Purple Prize in 2019 um, brings back some awesome memories. Uh, so mm -hmm. it makes me feel a little bit reminiscent. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I'd say, too, for, for your, your viewers that it was such a pleasure working with you um, actually as a co-facilitator in our Kamaki Nana design thinking program. And I had a chance to, I think, learn a lot from you about uh, human behavior and the way that teams interact and, um, and really how we can make the program an effective collaborative experience. So I, I just want to echo your kind words back and uh, share my appreciation for you. Thank you. Um, of course. Uh, anyways, though, um, uh, my career path and I guess how I got to my role, um, I guess it started in college, um, as most of our careers do. And I think that overall, um, I've had the privilege of being able to work in spaces that I'm passionate and interested in. Um, I, 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 in college, I studied political science, which I guess is unconventional for a person that works in the space that I work in now. Um, but I was really interested in college about uh, I, I think the intersection of power dynamics and um, economic development, um, and especially in so far as the way that that played out for big uh, uh, economic leaders uh, like the United States and peripheral countries, um, ones that were maybe dependent on the United States or vice versa that the United States was dependent on. Um, and um, so that, I guess, international lens um, led me to some work in uh, research uh, on international economic affairs um, and uh, a little bit of interning, uh, you know, free interning. It's not easy to find a paid job in that space um, without a master's degree or a PhD. Um, and so I, I did some interning for sure in the immigration space and um, ended up landing, I think, on a really valuable opportunity that kickstarted my interest in the impact investment space, which is where I work next. Uh, through an organization called the Trilateral Commission. I became a David Rockefeller fellow there. 
um, and had an opportunity to study um, uh, the role that governments played in investment uh, for uh, technological innovation and for artificial intelligence, especially in the Asia Pacific region. Um, and so I worked on uh, with a number of other really uh, impressive people who uh, far uh, for, who delivered far more value in that report than I did. Uh, I got a chance to learn a little bit about um, uh, how countries were thinking about uh, the future of work and 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 how they were investing in the future of work and, and their innovative economies. Um, and I also got a chance to peek into the impact investment space, and that's what got me super inspired around these kind of fringe or not fringe, but um, uh, uh, different kinds of investment that were being done in social and environmental impact uh, projects, especially those that were driven by technology. And so uh, I was in the Bay Area, I was based in Palo Alto at the time. And so I ended up um, landing a uh, internship and, 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 and ended up working as an impact investment analyst at an impact investment firm in Palo Alto called One World Training and Investments. Uh, we invested in early stage companies um, that were delivering a social environmental impact globally um, and consulted with companies uh, on their corporate social responsibility strategies uh, and things like that. Um, and uh, that is what put me in this space of working with entrepreneurs and being uh, fascinated with entrepreneurship and innovation. And um, being from Maui originally, I wanted to move back home, had the opportunity to do that uh, a little bit earlier than I thought. Uh, with the County of Maui as a legislative analyst in the county council. Um, and then from there, I uh, got picked up by the Purple Might Foundation, which is where I work now. And um, I was brought on to help turn an already kicking, already incredible program called the Purple Prize, which at the time was just an incentive challenge prize for uh, for indigenous innovators. Um, and uh, I, was, I was tasked with uh, growing that into a full-blown incubator program uh, where we would work with uh, local founders uh, who are values driven, uh, mostly uh, indigenous native Hawaiian. We would help them to create technology companies that were not only rooted in the values of this place, but created social and environmental impacts uh, in this place. So that's, uh, I guess, you know, what I'm doing now and then how I got there. So one of the things that I uh, found so fascinating about your uh, accelerate well I guess it's you know we can consider it as an accelerator for startups right for, specifically for tech startups and your approach is so different because you incorporate Hawaiian practices Hawaiian values and you consider a lot of the indigenous practices as a technology and there's a term that you use called uh, indigenous innovation. I really want to dive into that concept because I, I see that as being the heart of uh, the Purple Prize and what makes it so different from all the other accelerators that are out there. Um, so can we talk a little bit about that? Like, what does that term mean and why is it important and how does that factor into the entire Purple Prize ecosystem? Yeah, that's a really um, good and uh, deep question. We've been trying to figure out the answer to that question for a pretty long time and people, um, cultural practitioners and uh, incredible academics have been thinking about why indigenous innovation as well as um, practitioners in other communities like Aotearoa or, or in other indigenous communities and First Nations peoples in Canada have been really thinking about what innovation looks like when it's done from an indigenous place or indigenous context. Um, and in Hawaii, that, that, that even looks different. Um, and so we, as an organization, and as an initiative, Prize, have been trying to figure out what this thing means. And so we've been running just these incubator programs with these challenge prizes as, as experiments, I think. Um, in 2007 or 2016, when the program started, uh, that was an experiment to see if there was even anyone in the ecosystem uh, in Hawaii that was working on something mm -hmm. innovative uh, that was driven and, and, and founded in indigenous values and, and, and um, uh, uh, ancestral technologies. Um, in 2017, it was just a proof of that uh, original inkling that we got from the 2016 Purple Prize. And in 2019, we had enough conviction to really think about um, how do we prove out the business case for this technology ideology that actually exists. Um, and, and, and so that's what this has all been. It's just been a re repetition of experiments and, and, and really honing in on what this indigenous innovation concept actually means. Um, but where we're at right now is um, that indigenous innovation is the creation of a new thing. 
um, that is inspired by and rooted in um, the culture and values of the place that you're in. And so whether that place is in Hawaii or that place is in New Zealand or that place is in Canada, um, it's, it's, it's about what is indigenous in, in, the, in, in that place, in that community. Um, and generally, indigenous innovation is something that's done by indigenous people. But mm. um, we believe, and we've been learning about this, and so we're not, you know, we're, we're not prescriptive about any of our definitions or any of our uh, I, I ideologies. And, and a lot of these things are from my own experience as a non-Indigenous person, so I acknowledge that. Um, but we believe that people who are non-Indigenous can also innovate with an Indigenous mindset uh, or from an Indigenous context, as long as they assume authentically uh, the position of an ally with an Indigenous community um, and establish a really deep, authentic connection in that community. And the really important thing that I think is missed a lot of times by, by um, people who consider themselves allies to an Indigenous community or to a BIPOC community uh, is that reciprocity needs to be created with that community. And um, uh, that reciprocity can look a lot, a lot of different ways. It can be monetary, it can be non-monetary, and it can be other forms of capital, human capital, social capital. Um, it could be your intellectual capital that you donate to uh, an organization or just any kind of excellence that is, that is given to that community uh, is our forms of reciprocity. And I think as long as, as long as those things exist um, in a person who's not indigenous and is innovating with indigenous in indigenous ways in that place, um, I think it's possible. Uh, but we tend to just for safety uh, or, or really just for, for surety, uh, we call that place-based innovation. Um, and so we kind of operate with both and we, we try to cultivate both. Um, and, and, and I think that is, uh, you know, definitely where we're headed um, in more of an inclusive market-driven direction uh, with the Purple Prize. Yeah, um, actually, I wanted to see if we could show picture number four because a big part of the uh, experience, at least when I was in the Purple Prize, was being able to go into these incredible environments that, you know, I probably wouldn't have had access to any other way and have a foot in the door and just be able to go out there on the land and, you know, experience it and have uh, the practitioners talk to us about uh, what their, you know, what their practices are and how, and, and I think the part that's so uh, where the technology comes in and actually to have a different definition about technology, which I think is so important is that I think normally our mind, our, our mental model about technology is that it, it's driven by a computer, right? That you have a human computer interaction. But really when you're talking about indigenous technology, it's talking about the ecosystems that the Hawaiian uh, practices have done it, just even in land management, you know, and those are some of the wonderful things that we learned in our experience. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit also about some of the things that um, we, the students do as part of the experience. And if we can show some of those photos, uh, you know, we did a lot of team building, uh, classroom, uh, if you can show, yeah, so this is right. one of the... Uh, yeah, Sorry, please. if I can, please. if I can yeah. uh, add to what you're what you're sharing too, I mean the reason that we were able or were able to bring people into these communities is because of uh, the relationships that we have with people who are leaders in those communities, and so we have mm -hmm. um, a majority Indigenous board. Our organization was founded by two Indigenous men, um, and uh, we've developed relationships with the community that allow us to um, to help other people to have access to those kinds of opportunities. Um, and that picture that you showed in Waianae over at Kala Farms, um, you know, we have to thank, uh, you know, our board member, Kamu Inos, who's also the director of Indigenous Innovation, the first office of Indigenous Innovation in the, I think, the world, um, in a, in a post-secondary education system, um, and his father, Eric, uh, you know, are really the reasons why, um, uh, we're able to, uh, provide access to this kind of knowledge. And in these kind of opportunities, I mean, because those people are the people that carry the knowledge. We're just connectors and facilitators of those uh, those networking opportunities, I guess, in some ways. Um, but mm -hmm. technology is something that can be laid on top of those existing practices or those existing ancestral technologies, like the Aquaqua system or like Lokoia, uh, 
modern technologies can be laid on top of those and used to achieve um, uh, astounding technological results and innovative results. Uh, and, and so that's kind of, that's what really, we're really, really interested in is we're interested in seeing how can we take a, uh, an old technology um, mm -hmm. or how do we take an old uh, value system or practice and, and how we bring that into contemporary spaces and have the right kind of people uh, lead and speak about those technologies uh, in a way that is catalytic to cultural resurgence. Yeah, and I think that was the, that was the part that was so inspiring to me. I love systems thinking. And when we went out into the land, I just started to see this is, you know, uh, well, first of all, the first question I asked myself is who, how did these Native Hawaiians 700 years ago even come up with this? I mean, they didn't have GPS. They didn't have all the technology that we have. And yet they were able to figure out a land management system that is complete. It's the most well-designed system that I think I've, I've, I know of. And, you know, from managing what happens with the water at the mountain all the way down to the fish pond was just a marvel to me. And, and, uh, I, I kept on thinking, some, were they sitting around a fire some point and just coming up with this incredible system? I mean, how did that even happen? And I don't know if you guys have any insight into that, but I, that's the first question that came to me. It's like, who dreamt this up, you know? Because it's, it's really quite remarkable, that, that entire system. So um, mm -hmm. I would, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm super uh, interested in, how you're starting to see the evolution as you're working through the teams and you've had now some experience, are, are you starting to see the adoption of this model, the systems thinking model as it applies to Hawaiian practices? Are you starting to see some of that integrate into some of the teams and the problems that they're solving and the solutions they're coming up with? Definitely. Um, well, all of the teams that go through the Purple Prize, they, we, we try to embed those uh, things into the way they design their companies, the way they design their products, uh, the way they form their teams, and who they bring uh, into leadership positions on those teams. Uh, those are all things that we consider um, uh, as we go through you know, what was an eight-month process and now is a six-month process. Um, and so teams are definitely picking those things up. Um, uh, I mean, you could learn about all those without me going into too much depth uh, on our website, which is purpleprize.com. Um, but a couple, maybe a couple that I would highlight um, are one that's called Exchange Avenue, uh, which is uh, a company that has created a product that is essentially a, um, uh, it, it's, it's the Ahupua'a system and the economy that exists around the Ahupua'a system placed into a fintech no-code app. Um, and, and so this, that's an incredible innovation, super, super creative, uh, definitely was rooted in the relationships and the uh, cultural practices and the knowledge that he was able to get passed down from, uh, from uh, cultural practitioners in Kupuna that he talked about and interacted, interacted with John, John Garcia. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there, there's other examples. I don't want to take up too much time on those because I know there's other questions you want to get to, but definitely would encourage anybody who's uh, interested in, in, in examples of this indigenous innovation to check out the website. Yeah. Um, the other thing also I know is that um, you have been coming up with some interesting workforce innovation projects. Um, so I'd like for you to talk a little bit about that. And did I read I think I saw in your Instagram post that you folks just got awarded a fairly large federal grant for workforce <laughs> development. So I'd love to yeah. hear a little bit more about that too. But for sure, um, sure. Yeah, do you want to talk about that? Like what? Uh... Happy to really shortly. Now I I um uh, I don't run those programs. Uh, I, I I helped a little bit in the ideation of them, but we have two. Uh, really experienced, um, now three really experienced people who are, who are running this program uh, mm -hmm. called the Hiapo program. Uh, they've really taken it from idea and implementation, and they were the people, uh, along with um, one of our other co-founders, Kelsey Amos, who were able to raise uh, a relatively significant grant um, uh, that we put together in some ways in response to the, the coronavirus. We need to figure out how do we mm -hmm. uh, bring people from uh, uh, different backgrounds that 
that do not have techn uh, techn technological experience uh, into positions that are relatively economically uh, lucrative um, and uh, uh, are branches off into more long-term careers in the space. Uh, and so the Kiapo program focuses on Salesforce. Uh, it trains people in, um, I believe it's 14 weeks to become uh, Salesforce administrators and helps them to get certi certified and places them in Salesforce uh, administrator jobs in local companies where there's a significant need. Um, and uh, that's one of the, I mean, that's the workforce development program that we're working on. But uh, of course, the Purple Prize and the incubation of technology companies that we do there is uh, maybe also workforce development to just have a longer tail and requires people to uh, do a little bit more um, work and break out of their comfort zone uh, uh, in a way that um, requires people to do things that have never been done before. So um, that, I guess, is the distinction between the two different workforce development initiatives that we that we have. Um, so let's, uh, that, I think that's a great segue for um, workforce innovation also in terms of, you know, I think that you're working with a lot of different uh, startups, companies, and I was wondering if you've observed anything shifting as a result of COVID in terms of how companies are thinking about the future of work or um, and especially of how it relates to Hawaii. I mean, we've been in the service economy for so many years and we've been talking about trying to diversify for so many years and it almost looks like COVID has now accelerated that 100X. And just wondering if you're, if you, you know, if you've got your ear to the ground, if you're hearing anything of how things might be shifting or what you're starting to see in that landscape. Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting question. Um, and you know, I don't know if this is necessarily just because of COVID, but I'll provide kind of my observations um, generally about locally how workforce um, or how the future of work is being dealt with, in my point of view, uh, mm -hmm. and 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 maybe not globally, but maybe just a little bit less specifically. Um, uh, you know, I think that generally. Um, Locally, there's been a lot of efforts that have gone into digitization and into uh, uh, the improvement of work processes with technology. There's been awesome initiatives that have come out of Hawaii Technology Development Corporation under H, uh, under under DBED, uh, which have been awesome. The True Initiative, you know, is one of them, and uh, some other things that that come out of that organization um, have been really uh, catalytic to corporations, local corporations adopting new technologies and getting into the future of work. But um, I think um, uh, more broadly, um, there's also been uh, exciting um, improvements. I think generally there's been more attention given to diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, which is an important social aspect of the future of work that we don't really talk about. There has been um, more companies that are playing more active roles uh, in community engagement and more um, uh, active roles in uh, corporate social responsibility. There have been companies that are paying more attention to their carbon footprints. And so I think these are all mm -hmm. things that relate to the future of work because they're conditions that allow people to continue to work and allow companies to continue to thrive. Um, uh, one example um, uh, of that, that I'd say, uh, that really actually pertains to us and pertains to um, the indigenous context that we work in uh, is that there is a relatively large company that's been talking to us about how um, how they might be able to work with more indigenous mindsets in the creation of their products and the way that they um, uh, in the way that they uh, um, run their business uh, operations um, and thinking through those uh, uh, those different things through more of an indigenous mindset, more of a community based mindset in the places that they're actually based um, and uh, I can't share too much about it, too much details about it, but it's exciting that uh, a company is uh, of that size uh, is interested in working through um, uh, indigenous frameworks uh, and thinking about how they can engage more with community in an authentic place-based way. Wow, that is super exciting. Um, I'm, well, I know you can't talk, you know, specifics about that, but when you're talking about the companies that are starting to dive in more into diversity and inclusion and community engagement, do you have a sense of how, I mean, I think for me, when I hear um, 
companies talking about these these types of things, I often wonder how they're going to operationalize these these concepts because right now they're wonderful ideas. There's a lot of buzz terms being used, and um, I think companies, you know, want to look like they're um, taking a stand about social issues and things like that. But at the end of the day, being an an ex HR person, I know that the devil's in the details, right? In terms of how do you operational, how do you bring that into the culture of the company? How do you drive that throughout the entire company from CEO all the way down to, you know, the lowest level um, uh, position? So um, do you have a sense of that in terms of, you know, are HR people getting involved, for example, or is it still kind of more at the ideation stage and they're still trying to figure out the mechanics of it? Yeah. Um, well, I think there's two questions in there. There's one that is, you know, what is kind of, I mean, what is maybe my perspective about, um, about what companies should be doing? And there's a second question that's in that is 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 how are um, uh, these things actually being operationalized in, in a local context maybe? Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I'm going to be able to answer both, but I'll take a stab at it. Um, okay. And and I want to preface this too that um, in addition or to add on to my last answer, um, I I don't think that companies are doing enough. I think there's still a lot more that that needs to be done in order to achieve. Uh, equity in order to achieve uh, reduction in carbon footprint and regeneration uh, uh, of carbon um, and, and, and of our ecosystems. And so I think that there's still, we're way behind and we need, when there's a lot more to do. And so companies need to be more aggressive with those things and taking more of a regenerative approach, not even just a sustainable approach. Um, but in terms of you know, operationalizing uh, practices, I mean, I think it does come down to, to people. And this is where you and I really agree um, is that when, uh, when it comes down to people, who is in positions of leadership? And I think that more people of color, more people who, um, more indigenous people in our community need to be in the C-suite. They need to be in positions of corporate power and not just corporate power. Workforce also applies to the public sector uh, and it applies to the nonprofit sector. And I know there's a lot more indigenous people in positions of power in the nonprofit sector, but I'd, I'd, I'd uh, um, uh, encourage us all, uh, us being in the nonprofit sector as well, to um, uh, check on our diversity ac across the board uh, because we should be doing a better job generally, every single person, including the people that are, that are run by diverse um, uh, individuals. And, and I think that the second thing um, that I'd add to um, maybe the uh, uh, operationalization um, would be that we need to think about how we line up or how economic incentives are lined up with um, uh, the way that we manage people. Um, economic incentives shouldn't be necessarily dr uh, driven toward the um, creation of more value necessarily or more financial value. Uh, perhaps I, th I think that economic incentives can be uh, placed in the direction of creating more holistic values um, uh, lined up with uh, things that are more in the corporate social responsibility space that are more in the space of of uh, diverse and equitable hiring that are more in the space of um, uh, driving multiple bottom lines of growth. Uh, and I'd like to see those things happen too. Yeah, I think once again, this is where the indigenous practices can come in and because this is a systems thinking approach because it's not gonna be band-aid, you know, we have to really think holistically about all the moving parts. So uh, there's so much more I wanna talk to you about Alec, but unfortunately we've got to close. Um, so I wanna thank everyone for uh, checking out our show today. We've been talking with Alec Wagner from the Purple Prize. Thank you all for being here and please check back for our next show on Wednesday, November 4th at 3 p.m. I'll be talking to Vanessa Porter from a nonprofit program called Year Up in New York, based in New York. And they're an innovative nonprofit also that brings talented young adults from underserved communities and top tech companies together to help them launch their careers. So uh, until then, please be safe and be kind to one another and I will see you next time. Aloha and thank you, Alec, for being here. <laughs>